Hey, what's up, everybody? It's June 3rd. My name's Tomas. And I'm Thomas. And this is Tech Bus. Hey, everybody. We want to welcome you to our podcast. This is the first launch. Um, Tech Bus is kind of an acronym for technology and business. Uh, the kind of drive for our podcast is going to um, be to try to go through how technology and business kind of work together and sometimes have conflicts. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce you to Thomas Pizzo. Um, he's a CEO of Linkstream. He'll tell you a little bit more about himself. Yeah, uh, we have a company called Linkstream, and we do you know, custom software development, uh, consulting around technology for various businesses, and um, we also have products that we help uh, accelerate custom software with. So Awesome. Uh, kind of bring a little bit of both. Uh, was a trust and safety site security manager at my previous job, and then I also have a somewhat of a lucrative uh, engineering business uh, studio recording. So uh, we kind of bring in both of our uh, expertise, and, and we're definitely going to learn a lot and hopefully teach you guys something and bring on guests and, and hopefully get some topics from you guys in the YouTube comments. Uh, so don't be... You know, afraid to shoot us some ideas and some comments and let us know how we're doing so we can make this as entertaining as possible. Uh, we're going to start it off with just kind of giving a, every uh, podcast with just finding out what we've been up to. So, Tom, there's so much exciting things happening at Linkstream. Kind of give us an idea of what's going on. Yeah, and so, you know, right now we're working on two major projects, uh, one for a financial institution, one for healthcare. Um, around One's around survey, but actually both of them are around surveys, so that kind of seems to be a topic right now. Nice. Uh, customer satisfaction, employee compliance. Um, we're also talking to some different companies. Uh, yesterday I had a meeting with a company that's uh, doing flight logs for airplane mechanics, and nice. that's a whole different industry, uh, looking into doing some data analytics and um uh, uh, some dashboards into some data that they're collecting around uh, airplane repairs. So nice. A lot of different things going on this week, and um, how hard is it going to be to transition into something like that? Is that like way off what what uh, you've been working on so far since the beginning? No, I mean we work with all different types of businesses. You know, it doesn't you know matter particularly. You know, we do have some particular domain knowledge in that, but you know we try to work with the business to kind of understand how they work, and then we help consult and bring the technology in that that you know fits the pro fits solving the problems they have and giving them solutions. Awesome. So um, kind of give you guys an idea of the outline for the show. Um, we're going to bring in on a lot of guests. Um, sometimes we'll have some senior .NET art architects on here um, giving us an idea of what the, the wave of technology is. Um, we're going to bring some businessmen in here, some CTO, CTIs, and kind of pick their brain and, and find out how they're leveraging technology and where they see some of limitations happening. Um, before we bring a guest here, uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, kind of just run a few shows where me and Tom uh, get comfortable uh, running this thing and, and kind of getting to know you guys via the comments. Uh, first topic, we each picked a topic to talk about uh, with technology and business. I saw an article in NPR about an Omaha business called Do Space. And if none of you, I'm sure some of you know about it, but I'll just kind of give you uh, their definition. Do Space is a technology library providing free access to PCs that are loaded with software that could be used by businesses and artists. They have 3D printer, printers, laser cutters. Um, interesting thing about it, it, it's not funded by taxes. The Heritage Services, um, they actually donated $7 million to have this thing run. So it's wow. completely free to the public. Uh, so you can go there and print off a 3D whatever you want for free? Anything. Wow. Yeah, and a lot of entrepreneurs are running their business out of here. So my question to you, this is obviously not a for-profit type of thing, but a company saw an opportunity to leverage technology to kind of promote entrepreneurs and give an outlet to people who may not have access to this type of stuff but still need it to push businesses. How do you see that type of strategy when most strategies we see are, you know, uh, businesses just to make money? 
it's kind of like a long-term vision. What, what is your opinion on that? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, so, you know, we're located at Omaha, Nebraska, so there's kind of other, there's other groups like that, you know, just totally exist to bring innovation and talent into, into the area. Um, what are some other companies that people may need to know? About? Um, well, there's a there's the Omaha Startup Collaborative Exchange, which or Startup Exchange, which is downtown in the uh, old uh, Grain Exchange building. Oh, nice. We have an office down there, and there's a bunch of other startups. Um, a lot of uh, venture cap companies have raised venture capital or have new ideas, and it's just a low cost uh, office space with you know Wi-Fi, internet, and all that sort of thing, and conference rooms uh, for companies that are just trying to start up with uh, technology and kind of foster that innovation and cross communication and access to different mentors and things like that and also cheap office space so um, I, that's one other thing I know in town but this is kind of even a little different because it's open to the public it sounds like anybody can go there even if you're not necessarily running a business you're just wanting to see the new technology or work with it yeah for sure uh, a really cool thing <clears throat> that they they noted they noted which you could probably know more. This is probably impressive to people who know more about it, but it says uh, every day they have one gigabit minimum available with a potential of 10 gigs. I mean, is that impressive? Or, or that's the, the internet speed? Or? Yeah, or just uh, they said the, the push of technology um, is powered by that fundamental strength in their technology is that innovative is that um that type of availability is that a standard or is that uh, kind of on the edge of technology i'm not sure what the what the bandwidth average is over there but i know that there's something like google fiber which is like extremely fast internet that um i don't know, know that it's available here in omaha but i think there may be spots in kansas city i think in lincoln they have some access pots for Google Fiber. Uh, this may be something similar to that, mm. where yeah, it's going to dramatically increase the the speed of the internet. So, mm. I think long term, internet's going to take over everything. I mean, it's going to be streaming video, streaming access to applications. Um, you know, it's already become that really in some ways. But as this as these internet speeds increase, you know, it's going to open up a whole new like whole new um, possibilities for the type of technology that you can that you can deliver over the internet. So, what I thought was interesting is they labeled this a library with no books. <laughs> so, kind of going along with what you said, uh, could that be our future? Could literally we have no more libraries and everything just be digital? Or do you think there will ever be a push? for trying to trying to maintain that type of uh you know old style old fashioned um history of our develop you know our, our learning and, and development or do you think we're moving towards everything that we touch is going to be digital well i mean i still buy books like when i read certain books i like to have a hard copy and read so i don't know if that's going to ever totally go away but certainly you know the majority of books are more more and more books are being consumed like through ebooks and e-readers and things like that um yeah i mean i don't know who who goes to the library and checks out books <laughs> other than maybe kids and stuff like that but i i just did for my daughter yesterday yeah for kids yeah I mean, we do that for our kids too but i mean mm -hmm. most of the content that i consume and read is online it's not you know you know, I don't read the newspaper. I don't. I don't go to the library and check out. I mean, do they still have those card catalogs there? Where you have like, I, I imagine they probably do. The, I remember that in like middle school. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think you know our kids probably don't even know what that that would even be. So, do you think that affects businesses in the long run in a positive fashion, or do you think the wave and how it's pushing so fast is going to lead lead to so many of these businesses? Uh, finding out that it's just a little bit too late for them to get on the bandwagon. Well, I'm not sure how to answer that. I mean, I think the companies that are trying to innovate and use technology are going to be the ones that succeed in the long run. I mean, I think that that's the one of the biggest competitive advantages that a company can have is, you know, leveraging technology, information, you know, things like analytics, just understanding your data, um, being able to create oversight and um, compliance and efficiency, all these things, that's what technology brings. So I think that, you know, companies that aren't 
adopting that are going to fall behind and um, you know over the long run and I think that that companies that see technology not as a as a cost but as really an investment um, are going to succeed and that's what I've seen you know working with various companies is that really the more innovative the more open they are to technology and not just any sort of technology but using it right um, you know they're seeing gains over the long run so we're back uh welcome back to tech bus um i'm thomas Tomas. and uh, we're going to start in our second segment uh you know first we were talking kind of about local business uh do space which is a you know a bookless library they're calling themselves a place yeah. where you can go and use some nice hardware and different computers 3d printers that sort of thing uh here in town but now we're going to kind of go to a uh, more national or almost global topic that I've been reading about, and uh, it's it's related to foreign governments and U.S. tech giant companies. So, okay. companies like Google, uh, Amazon, YouTube, all these type of companies, and in the way that uh, foreign governments outside the United States are reacting to them. So, okay. for a couple examples, like over in in France, the have a lot of laws in place to try and kind of help protect French culture and, and French local businesses. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, the way they, they somewhat control the media and entertainment, things like that, and the way things, and, and even some of the, the purchasing um, uh, activity that the citizens have. But with these new companies like YouTube and Amazon, it's totally changing the way that people are buying things or people are consuming media, entertainment, all that stuff. Um, and a lot of these nation states are struggling with how to how to like retain control. And um, they're going after some of these tech giants, you know, for things like privacy and, and uh, um, monopoly, you know, charges and things like that. So mm. that's kind of the topic we were talking about is how, how is business being affected by technology on, on the you know, global scale. So I was just curious what your thoughts are about that, Tomas. Is that kind of in relation? I thought I I saw something on the news the other day, and forgive me, I don't know the country, but we were making a lot of deals um, in uh, some of these countries, but some of the laws in place protected their technology. So they wanted to make sure they could innovate and create things, but still keep it proprietary. Is that kind of in the line of, of what you're talking about? Yeah, I haven't heard. I mean, I wonder if that was something in China, but... Yeah, it, it might have been, but it was for sure that they wanted to make these deals, but, but they put protection in place because they want to kind of save their technology or what of innovate, innovation. Is that common? Do we do that as well? Is that something that the United States does? Because it kind of seems like... Um, I mean, I think we have one of the most open laws as far as like what you can do with with business, and I think that's why we're one of the most in, you know the most innovative country in the world is you know there's a lot of freedom to do that sort of thing. Um, I think that you see some of these uh, like dinosaur what I call dinosaur industries trying to you know force people into a certain way of doing things. Like I think of Uber, you have all these cities and countries banning Uber because you have that basically they want to preserve the status quo with the taxi system. Right. You know, and um, you start seeing some of these things with Amazon getting locked down and and even, like, Google getting charged with antitrust. And you, you have to wonder, like, is there some sort of political motive behind that? Um, so I think, yeah, it can kind of go two-way street where sometimes, uh, you know, business or governments can stifle technology and stifle innovation because it's disruptive. It's disruptive to the status quo, to the mm-hmm. way things have always been. Right. And you were mentioning uh, in our previous segment about, you know, people that kind of get stuck in a business model. They don't want to, they don't want to, you know, adapt and, and, and try and do technology because, you know, what they've been doing for 50 years works, you know, right, they don't right. want to change. Right. That's understandable. Um, but I think it's kind of along the same lines. It's like, you know, they have a system and it works and you know don't shake the boat so what would france feel like with their people getting involved with technology let's just take for example facebook twitter youtube 
what part of that technology threatens their culture? I, that's where I'm failing to get this. Well, like, uh, I think mm-hmm. one of the examples I read with Amazon was like people purchasing things. So they want to force Amazon to have a certain percentage of sales from local businesses, uh-huh. not just because then it becomes like, you know, this basically all the goods are getting funneled in from this foreign American company, Okay. you know, um, instead of through the local economy. And I think I think there's more pressure on these companies because they're from the United States. You know, the United States kind of more supports them because they're under our government, they're under our taxes, you know. And some of these other nations maybe don't have as much control over, you know, what exactly these companies are doing. Mm. And uh, I think they're trying to kind of push back against that a little bit. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. And I'm curious, what are, what are some of your theories? I mean, how do you think this is going to pan out? I think what I, when I look at it, tech, it's kind of like a clash between technology and culture. And what I mean by that is I think what most people are scared about is if you just kind of look at even our childhood, we were outside. You know, you couldn't, your mom had to scream at you to come inside. And, and my mom, single mother, worked two jobs uh, to, to make us uh, uh, working great, would scream at 9 o'clock to come in. And now it's like these kids globally are stuck on Facebook, are stuck on Twitter. And I think it's less about the technology and more about, I think, countries and cultures realizing that maybe technology is innovative in a lot of areas, but it also is kind of disconnecting us from each other. I mean, what did we do before phones? What did we do before Facebook? Literally, what did we do before Twitter? I mean, and now what do we do every day? Um, and I, I think, I mean, what's your opinion? Is that, is that valid? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's valid to say that, you know, social media and some of this stuff has, in a sense, made us less truly social. You know, it's, um, you know, I remember growing up and I knew all my neighbors and, right. you know, you just go to somebody's house. You wouldn't have to call them first. You just go right. and knock on their door. Now you know, right. that's almost like a rude thing to do. You got to right. call first, or why would you even come over? Just send me a Facebook message. You know? right. So, yeah, I think that's part of it. I think, um, but I think there's also, um, you know, there's issues of like privacy mm-hmm. and economics. So mm-hmm. I think that a lot of some of the European countries have maybe kind of stricter attitudes towards like personal privacy and. Um, Whereas maybe Americans also have a problem with that, but the governments aren't getting as involved in like regulating that. Um, so I think there's maybe some cultural differences on like how people feel towards business and technology like in their personal lives. Mm-hmm. Whereas I think in America there's a very open attitude of, you know, everybody wants to use all the latest technology and Mm -hmm. most people say they don't want all these companies tracking them but they don't really care they're on amazon but i think some of the governments in europe and even the people are more you know very sensitive to that stuff and then they they want the right to be kind of more private with their with their online data but i think that's a trend you know so there's going to be issues with um you know tax laws number one like goods and services are sold Mm -hmm. over the internet issues of privacy, um, issues of how is it affecting the culture, uh, things like entertainment and media, you know. Uh, one, of the, one of the articles I was reading talked about how, um, you know, even the news, how it was consumed, you know, previously was, like in countries in Europe, it was kind of funneled through the established media there and the government had some sort of control over it. Right. But now pe- no one's watching that anymore. They're watching right. YouTube. Right. You know, and YouTube is this big company that is an American company, Mm -hmm. you know. So getting to that point, it kind of seems like some of the waves that are happening with technology, um, and if we just step back and look at the companies, are coming from America. So do you feel like it's an attack on America when it may not be the intention of that. It may be just that, like you said, this is a technology hub. So it's we're creating things and we're putting them out into the universe, but others see that as maybe we're trying to go out and dominate globally in the market, when in reality, it's simply just, 
it's simply just kind of the law of nature. I mean, you put something out that's that's that innovative and that cool, people are going to want it. And the reason I say that is I was watching this documentary on Vice, and it was about Cuba and how they consume all of our culture now. And it's been happening not with just Obama's visit and stuff like that, but they, I forgot the name of it, but what it's called is it's just a USB. So a guy will go on the internet, download all of the technology, you know, like people who want like music, you know, I'm in music, so people who like to make their own music, Fruity Loops, the latest, uh, whatever is on Netflix, uh, Twitter, everything, and then they'll, these people pay for them weekly to come and drop it off so they consume the latest thing from America. So it kind of seems like the government, like it's an American takeover, but it's the people wanting to consume the technology and the, the stuff that interests them. Um, do you think America has those intentions or do you think it's just natural? No, I think it's just happening. You know, I think that, you know, we're an innovative company. We kind of, in a sense, started the internet mm -hmm. and a lot of these companies... Al Gore started the internet, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, originally it was a military thing, but... Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think I think countries see that as a threat potentially because, you know, if if you're China and all your citizens are getting their information from YouTube, it right. might be a little concerning. So, for sure, I think we'll see you know a crackdown and uh, you know as business is helping um, or as technology is helping businesses innovate, you can see some of these you know more. Uh, traditional businesses and maybe even nation states and governments kind of try and stifle technology. So it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Uh, you know, people are even talking about, like, now the Internet's kind of this wide open thing across countries, but is it going to become, like, segregated where you have, like, these little subnets with yeah. each country, you know, kind of controlling, like, you know, Russia has its own social media right. and its own YouTube or whatever. Right. Um, you know, it could really, unfortunately, if it doesn't, pan out right could kind of really diminish the the kind of wide open nature of the of the internet but personally i think the genie's out of the bottle i mm -hmm. mean they're gonna try but you know it's you know you look at even in europe in like the 1500s when the printing press was invented causes revolutions you know i think it's the same thing with the internet yeah you know arab spring you know that was because of Twitter and, and, and things like that, right. and technology that people were communicating and sharing ideas and challenging what the state media was saying. So, right. you know, I think there's going to be that push, but I think, you know, like I said, the genie's out of the bottle. You can't, you can't go back.